Hi, I'm Jeff from Really Active, and cities are humanity's greatest invention. That's not according to me, but that's what I found out two years ago at Startup Fest when Dr. Colin Harrison presented this log log plot at 9 a.m. in the morning to a bunch of people who had too many drinks the night before. And I'll spare you the details of that log log plot, but just understand that citizens are what made cities smart. The fact that we aggregated a lot of people, specialists, generalists, all together in a city, bumping up against one another, that's what made cities punch above their weight in terms of innovation. That's why Dr. Colin Harrison thought they were the number one thing. So if we've made smart cities as citizens, how should smart cities give back to us? <laughs> well, the argument I make is that smart cities should actually make us superhuman. What do I mean by that? Well, the smart city has the promise with its extensive connectivity and all these next generation technologies to be able to create super efficiencies. So reducing things like waste, reducing things like transit time, increasing things like serendipitous interactions, and increasing resource utilization in the sense that we can fill buses fuller, uh, fill waste bins fuller, all that. So that's great, but there's a problem. And that's, what does your smart city actually know about you? What does it know about you in real time, in context? Here's a city, Montreal. It's a smart city. I took this photo uh, last week. You have a bunch of people that are out on the street. What do we know what they're doing? What does the city really know about them? But they're there with a purpose, right? Every single one of these people is there for a reason in the city. They're not just wandering around. Well, OK, there's some exceptions. But for the most part, people are there for a reason. Someone might have special needs. Someone might be looking for that sweater they found on Facebook. They're shopping. They're supporting the local economy. You have people as well that are looking to get from place A to place B the fastest. Maybe they think the metro is the fastest. Maybe it's in a tail. Maybe it's in an Uber. Couldn't a smart city help out with that? And then, of course, you have our tourists, which are very important in Montreal, which are probably looking for poutine or smoked meat or whatever it may be. And again, they face challenges. They have to go through interfaces and apps, where is the best poutine, all the rest. The reality is, every single one of these citizens is probably carrying or wearing a device today that can make them at least anonymously identifiable in real time. And that's thanks to Bluetooth Low Energy. So what we do is we make sensors that can detect the signals, Bluetooth Low Energy coming off of phones and wearables that these people are carrying. And using 5G technology, we would be able to relay this information back to the cloud. So we can at least anonymously identify people, if not go further. How this works, in a quick nutshell, so again, we have five minutes, we won't go too technical, but if we can be identified, our, our, back, our back end can essentially associate you with whatever data you're willing to share about yourself. You already exist on the web. So we just take a device you're carrying, associate it with what already exists about you, and then many third parties can actually vector experiences and efficiencies back to you in the real world in real time. So is this real? Yes, it is. We've had commercial success for about two years in retail. We've been in smart offices. And today, we're focusing on out of home, which has a very close relationship with smart cities. On the scientific side, we've gone the route of publishing. We've published at conferences at IEEE on Internet of Things, machine to machine, RFID. Uh, now we're looking at pervasive computing. Where does Ericsson fit into the mix? Ericsson has three things that we need and do not have. One, the connectivity back to the cloud, 5G. Power, sensors need power. If you can put in the connectivity mode with power, you've got it. And finally, being able to deal with cities at a city scale, cities, even small ones, uh, sometimes struggle to deal with startups. So if we sum up what the platform looks like, on this side is the real world. Here we are as superhuman citizens, and we're carrying these devices. On the other side is the cloud. And Ericsson can bring us there easily throughout a city. And on that side, you have every single platform who would love to know whatever information you're willing to share about yourself in real time, in the real world, to be able to give you back an experience. And what that looks like from a business model perspective is you have a real-time data marketplace. You have a lot of producers, us superhumans. You have a lot of consumers, all of those platforms. And it'll move towards a marketplace of exchange. So I'll close off on the, the slide of market share, which is great timing. Uh, so if you take a look at Cisco's predictions for Internet of Things, the largest market share that they give, again, the numbers are ridiculous, but the largest piece of the pie is actually customer experiences. So us, we superhumans, we matter. And there's a lot of money in that. On the other side, there's also the uh, global ad spend, which is huge. And if you look at the hardware market, 
beacons and other location technology similar to this, it's still a large market. The intersection of all this, there's room to park a lot of unicorns and do some amazing things. So thanks for your time. I look forward to your questions. Merci. Les questions. Questions. I can start. Uh, I, I like the idea that you are going a bit further than beacons, but how would this in praxis practice work? Do every user that you want to collect data from need to load something down in their phone? No, the beauty of this is that if you have uh, an Apple phone and you have Bluetooth turned on uh, through AirPlay and AirDrop, you're actually broadcasting a lot about yourself. Your ID cycles every 15 minutes, you're yeah. anonymous. So just when we set up our demo booth in the back, we started there were about 15 devices, and then when we came to the front here, we already at about 50 devices we were just anonymously detecting uh, from this room from just two sensors back there. Um, so that, the great news with that is you have anonymous data. So if you just want to do traffic flows, if you had St. Catherine Street wired up with this, you could do real-time heat mapping and flows of where things are. You, know, you could even start vectoring people to shops that are seeing less traffic. You can, uh, over time, then look at the taxation, where are the highest density zones. That's purely anonymous. That's no change on our part as citizens. But where it gets really exciting is if you do install an app or you do associate your Fitbit with your profile, you can go further. We've done that with retail loyalty, which has been very well received. Uh, Co-working spaces, love it. You walk into the space, it recognizes you. People love to opt in for that. Um, and it's, to my knowledge, has never been done on, a, on the scale of a smart city. But what I'm saying is technically it's feasible, and with the right willpower in the right city, there's nothing blocking us from doing it tomorrow. <clears throat> Would the cities buy your sensors, or would you sell the data? What is, how would you work with that? So it's a great question. So we haven't sold to cities yet, so we're yeah. not sure where they're going to push back on which model. The way we'd like to do this eventually is obviously a transactional model, where here's the infrastructure for free. We know that the transactions are going to pay for it. And again, the sensors really are not that expensive. So at the end of the day, that's possible. Today, how we typically sell is on a SaaS model. So it's per sensor, per point of interest, you're paying a certain monthly fee. Because again, we have to do our cloud piece, which is really just taking the data in real time, making the associations, and pushing it out. We have to support that. I would, I would maybe tend to say that in some cases, they like CapEx more than OPEX, but. You, you can buy it too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just a question of price, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, the interesting use for what you're talking about is that um, many cities are hoping, like with their innovation districts, that by putting the innovation in there, it will encourage folks to come to those districts and, and, and you know, so how can we measure foot traffic, how can we see a baseline and see that the impact that is happening because of the smart projects that are being deployed. So there's uh, an obvious um, potential to associate that with base, baselining in these districts. I agree. One last technical question for me, or it's maybe commercial. Uh, where do you see this competing? Is that a com competition with the Beacon setups? Uh, no, well, the way we see it is Beacons did a, a really great job of getting us excited about being able to have hyper-local context, uh, really yeah. being able to understand in our lives. Uh, the challenge with Beacons is um, they don't work as quickly and as well as, uh, as many uh, would hope. So in a retail sense, for instance, you want to change something on digital signage when someone walks past. Unfortunately, the beacon doesn't work quickly enough. Um, the way we've come, my background is in real-time location systems. So for me, it's always worked in the opposite direction of the beacon. Uh, and that's why we've taken this approach. Uh, but they're really complementary. So an example that's somewhat outside of smart cities, or let's say you have a, a, a kiosk. Having a beacon in a kiosk and letting your phone know that it's close, that works great. And our devices also work as beacons. Yeah. But the value is there's so much data that's uncaptured today that's just oozing out of us from the devices we carry and wear. And that's the part we think is the most valuable and that's underutilized today. And maybe the most scary, right? Depends on how you look at it. I tried to present it in a nice way. Come see after, and I'll show you yeah. what we can detect about you. I'll be happy to show everything that your phone is revealing not about you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, very good pitch and presentation, yeah, exactly. I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. Very good. Merci. Thanks for your time. Merci beaucoup. Voilà la première partie qui est terminée. Alors on vous on vous propose, si vous voulez, de prendre une pause de 15 minutes. On se revoit.